Uhuru. We are live. It is 5.59 Eastern Standard Time. And I am with Jesse Neville, chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, coming in Uhuru. from St. Louis, Missouri, where our chair is on the ground. Today was uh, participating in building the new St. Louis Uhuru House. Welcome. This is the Solidarity Spear Study. We are back after a week hiatus. I am Valerie Bronte, the InfoEd Interim Chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And uh, this is the Burning Spear Study. The Solidarity Spear Study um, focuses on the African internationalist perspective of the African People's Socialist Party major organ of propaganda, the Burning Spear. So what is the Burning Spear? It is the oldest revolutionary newspaper still in print. It is the voice of the International African Revolution and it's print and online published by the African People's Socialist Party and affiliated with the African Liberation Movement. It's understanding the world today through the political lens of African internationalism, which is the materialist political philosophy of the African working class developed by Chairman Omali Ishitala. And the paper um, has been in existence and published without interruption since 1967. And the Solidarity Spear Study is part of the information education programming of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Welcome, Jesse, our chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uhuru. Can you, uh, let, you. Us, let us know about uh, the history of this movement and, uh, and, and, what, and what Uhuru Solidarity Movement is all about? Absolutely. Well, first of all, Uhuru to Valerie, the Chair of Information and Education for the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and to all of you who are watching. And I'm very honored to participate in this very uh, important spear study that comrades Valerie and Connor normally carry out every weekend. And the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is the organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. The African People's Socialist Party is an all black, all African, working class led revolutionary party that is struggling for the total liberation and unification of Africa and African people everywhere under the leadership of the African working class. It was formed and is led by Chairman Omalia Shatella, who developed the political philosophy of African internationalism that we as white people have the ability to embrace as our own worldview and see the world as it really is through the eyes of the oppressed, through the eyes of the African working class. And based on the understanding that white people sit on the pedestal of the oppression of African people and that we owe reparations to African people and that all the resources in the white world have come at the expense of the enslavement of African people, the genocide against the indigenous people of this land and colonialism all over the world, the African People's Socialist Party formed the solidarity movement under its leadership to go back into the white oppressor nation population so that we can take responsibility for organizing other white people to stand in solidarity with black liberation, black power, and the African revolution. And our three principles of unity are that one, we are under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. The African working class calls the shots in their own struggle for liberation. We stand in solidarity with African self-determination. No one but African people has the right to lead the struggle of African people for their national liberation. And most importantly, based on those two things, we organize white people. We organize in the white community for reparations to African people. So those are the three principles of unity. And if you agree with those three things, then you should become a member by going to uhurusolidarity.org slash join dash USM and become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uhuru. Thank you so much, Joe Jesse, and uh, I'm putting the link up there. Somebody could share that in the comments. That would be fantastic. And uh, yes, we absolutely um, must, be because the African liberation must be led by African people and we unite with African self-determination to lead this struggle and to be their own liberators. 
we must study um we must study under the leadership of the African American class. This is why we study the burning spear because as white people, we cannot even begin to properly understand or articulate the conditions faced by African and colonized people under colonialism from our perspective on the pedestal of oppression. So we have to study under the leadership of the African working class in order to, to, to really understand how to unite in solidarity with this struggle. So this is a shortened introduction today because we have um, Jesse on as our very special guest to present the Solidarity Movement's response and statement on the Parkland, Florida mass school shooting that recently happened. And uh, Jesse um, um, is from Broward County, Florida and uh, can certainly speak to, um, you know, the terror uh, of, 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 you know, that is visited upon the African working class also by white imperialism around the world. And I'm really excited to hear um, the wonderful presentation he has for us today. Uhuru, take it away. Uhuru. So, um, so what I'm gonna read is a statement on behalf of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement regarding this shooting. And we felt like it was important to sum this up from the perspective of African internationalism, because right now, every political opportunist under the, under the sun is jumping upon these 17 dead people in Parkland, Florida, in order to use what happened there to push their own agenda. And no one is really saying the truth about why this happens as often as it does and what can be done to put an end to it. So um, first of all, I just want to reiterate that all of the understandings that we put out in this study come from the African People's Socialist Party, come from Chairman Amali Shetela and the political theory and worldview of African internationalism. And, you know, we only begin to understand the world through embracing African internationalism. So uh, the name of this statement and I am gonna read it. I know that it can be boring, but I'm gonna to try to do a good job reading it to you. And then hopefully, you know, if there's any questions or anything like that later on, we can address it. So the name of the statement is, it's not guns or mental illness, it's white society. Uh -huh. Parkland, uh -huh. Parkland was the 18th school shooting on a predominantly white school campus in the United States in this year alone. And it's only February, clearly, we are not looking at some freak occurrence that can be understood by studying the psyche of the shooter. We are looking at a problem within white American society itself. And although the US government and media are working overtime to exploit the deaths of 17 people, mostly children, to hold empty, meaningless debates and rally us behind their cynical agendas, the reality is that no amount of gun control reform or mental health counseling will solve this problem. How can we expect to reform a society built on murder, violence, and rape? America and white society are built upon the mass murder of millions of African and indigenous children whose hopes and dreams and lives were crushed to build the pedestal of stolen wealth that has fed white people for the past 600 years. When the media refers to Parkland and Sandy Hook as the deadliest mass shootings in American history, they are using the deaths of these white children to deny and obscure the massive scale of murder that forged the US social system from its inception. No school shooting that has taken place since the beginning of this year compares to the Sand Creek Massacre of November 29, 1864, when 700 white people attacked and destroyed a village of Cheyenne and Arapaho people encamped in southeastern Colorado territory killing and mutilating nearly 200 indigenous people. No school shooting has ever approached the scale of horror that unfolded during the 1921 attack and bombing of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when white mobs shot, burned, and slaughtered up to 300 Africans in the economically thriving Greenwood community. The culture of white society is spawned by the daily lynchings that we carried out against African people for over 100 years of the turn of the century, hanging black bodies from trees and mutilating them for fun 
as we posed in front of their burning corpses with our children, smiling for the camera. This is the substance from which our violent white culture was born. And this violence began long before the invention of the AR-15. As Penny Hess, chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee wrote in the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, quote, white people are indeed forever haunted by our past and present relationship to the genocide against native and African people. Could it be that the inherited weight of these crimes on the shoulders of white youth plays itself out in the epidemic of violence against their parents, teachers, and schoolmates? White youth are simply turning back on white society, what has historically been our normal and consistent behavior towards the majority of other peoples on the planet. The mass murder, mutilation, dismemberment should be no surprise when we, white people, discover our true history. We are witnessing an implosion of the culture of violence, end quote. And that's from Penny Hess's book, Overturning the Culture of Violence. Nothing short of complete social transformation will bring this to a halt. And if we are genuinely grief stricken by the murder of children, then our grief cannot be reserved only for white children. The implosion of white violence that reared its head last week in the form of Nicholas Cruz prowling the halls of the high school in Parkland with an AR-15 is rooted in the daily global killing of African, Mexican, Arab, and Asian children. And that should fuel us to take action so that all children are free to live and grow in peace. Every white parent should think about this. We don't want our children to die, but we should be equally disturbed by the fact that under this social system, the only way for our children to live is for other children to die, for colonized children to die, for African children to die. This is the inescapable dialectic, as Chairman Omalia Shatella has defined it, between the happiness of white people and the suffering of African people. As Chairman Omalia Shatella wrote, every, dream and every white dream and aspiration requires drone strikes in Pakistan. Our security depends on their suffering. It was a normal, peaceful day at school for America's white children on the day when Tamir Rice, 12 years old, was gunned down by the Cleveland police while he played on a playground. It was a normal day at school for our white children when the Detroit police stormed into the home of a seven-year-old Ayanna Jones and shot her in front of her grandmother, shot her in the head in front of her grandmother, who later described that she watched the light in Ayanna Jones's eyes go out. The white school children of Pinellas County, Florida, did not have to hide under their desks in fear. The morning after the Pinellas County Sheriff's deputies chased three teenage African girls, Dominique Battle, Lanaya Miller, and Ashanti Butler into a cemetery pond and forced them to drown in a painful, torturous death. On every normal afternoon when a white kid jumps into the backseat of the car after school, the peace that we take for granted translates thousands of miles away into the horror-stricken screams of Palestinian children whose arms are blasted from their sockets by the genocidal Israeli military forces. There is a direct relationship between these two realities, and it is that which boils over every time a white kid picks up a gun and walks into a school campus. This is the hidden cost of our white lifestyle built on violence. It is the violence of white life turning inward. It is the violence which African people who are forced to bury their children every day are fighting to overturn. It is the violence which Arab and Mexican people who are forced to bury their children every day are fighting to overturn. And it is the violence which we too as white people must take responsibility to overturn by working under the leadership of the African revolution, which will liberate all of humanity from the fear and insecurity of life inside of a dying empire. The African People's Socialist Party is the heroic revolutionary party of African workers fighting to build a peaceful socialist world where no child lives at the expense of other children. The way we can join in building this future is by taking responsibility for our culture of violence, by overturning it through organizing in the white community to build a new revolutionary culture of reparations to African people. White people owe reparations for the violence we have wrought against humanity. And it is through repairing the damage we have done to the rest of the planet's peoples that we can end our own self-imposed isolation 
in a cold, inhuman society where violence reigns supreme. There is no future inside the society of the slave master who will be brought down by the enslaved. And we should make a commitment to our children that they should not have to inherit the legacy of the slave master that we inherited upon birth into this social system, nor should they have to inherit the culture of white violence. The next generation of white people should inherit the legacy of white reparations to African people. Join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uhuru. Uhuru. Wow. Well, I just, I had the, I had the awesome opportunity of getting a little bit of a preview of this presentation um, while we were organizing um, this uh, broadcast today. But um, I just really deeply appreciate and unite, I mean, just the urgency with which we need to come under revolutionary organization um, under the leadership of the African working class to overturn uh, this legacy that we have of genocide and slavery and oppression. It's just, it's just so essential and it's so timely. And, you know, as we understand, you know, we talk, um, you know, we're, we learn from um, the perspective of African internationalism and Chairman Amalia Shetela, um, what the crisis of imperialism looks like mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and the indications of uh, the deepening of this crisis and the urgency um, and the rapid deterioration of, uh, of imperialism around the world as African and colonized people rise up in resistance. Um, and yeah, it's, if, if, if the state of the world today um, is bothering you, it's because you're finally uh, now being impacted <laughs> by, um, by colonialism and white power. And uh, yeah, I just I really deeply appreciate um, Jesse, uh, Chair Jesse coming on Solidarity Spear study today to share this with us because um, yeah, I mean, nobody wants children to be gunned down, but we have to, if we really want to overturn this, we really want to overturn and make, make um, schools safe or make, you know, it's like you have to think in a more global perspective and understand that, you know, the majority of the world um, is suffering in the hands of white power, is suffering in the hands of colonialism and imperialism. And there is no safe school in Afghanistan. There's no safe school right. in Pakistan. There's no safe school. You know, and, and we, we want to make the world safe for white children is what the Democratic Party is now rallying around. And I yep. just want to take a moment um, and say uh, huru and salute all the folks who have joined us on the um, broadcast today. Uh, Uhuru Jackson, Uhuru uh, Lori O'Hara, Uhuru Janae, Uhuru Nicardo, Uhuru Evan, and I'm so excited for this. Uhuru Comrade, Comrade Hallie is in Boston with a viewing party in Boston tuning in. Uhuru, that is so awesome. Uhuru Evan, and Jackson says, Thank you, Chair Jesse, for summing up the epidemic of school shootings through the lens of African internationalism. Who, comrade? Who, Tristan? All right, well, that that's just marvelous. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I uh, we don't have a, a Burning Spear article from uh, this month's Burning Spear that addresses the school shooting, but um, we are you know, almost overwhelmed with the amount of analysis that um, the Bernie Spear has brought to mass shooter violence in the United States. And so we are reading um, today an article from the Bernie Spear in 2012 um, in the wake of the uh, Sandy Hook shooting in Connecticut, which was another massacre uh, uh, in a majority affluent white school um, in uh in, in Connecticut, and uh, I'm going to link this right now. Bear with me. It's when, you know, we had the, the fervor whipped up for the gun control conversation at that, at that point in time. And, and really just so grateful and deeply appreciative of the Bernie Spear and, 
the necessity of the Bernie Spear um, as far as like for us, for white people to understand um, how this how this crisis is deepening um, through through the perspective of African internationalism. And so this article is called War on Terror Overlooks Connecticut Shooter. War on African Community Intensifies. Um, this is from December 18th, 2012, Oakland. On December 14th, 2012, a camouflaged gunman burst into the Sandy Hook Elementary School in the wealthy Connecticut suburb of Newton with a semi-automatic assault rifle and two pistols where he fired more than 100 rounds into the bodies of 20 small children, six adult women, and into himself, leaving a total of 27 dead and many wounded. All of the victims and the shooter were white. And surely incidents like these, which occurred in Connecticut, will be used by the state as justification to clamp down on the circulation of guns and firearms throughout this country. Of course, this repression will come under the guise of the war on domestic terror. However, what is less certain is that the terrorists targeted by the imperialist state will never be white like the man who massacred those children in Connecticut. In the process of writing this article, a Google search was conducted with the keywords quote, terrorism in Connecticut. Out of 9,450,000 hits, only two made references to the shooting in the, in the Connecticut mass murder. The other 9,499,999 were about the black and brown terrorists. Even as ruling class media refers to the Connecticut shooting as one of the worst in U.S. history, it will never do so at the cost of tainting the politically pure image of the white man. White men are described as pioneers, visionaries, champions of democracy, civilizers, and trailblazers. And terrorists? Never. This is despite the irrefutable history of rape and pillage, the blood of Africans and indigenous people of the North American continent that white people have on their hands. Just as the general white population has experienced unconditional exempt status from the category of criminal and terrorist, so has white power as a whole. And we ha must remember that the U.S. government and military itself is the biggest terrorist to have ever existed. Just days before the Connecticut shooting, United States President Barack Hussein Obama made an announcement that he was sending a convoy of troops armed with Patriot missiles to the Middle East for the express purpose of stopping the use of weapons of mass destruction. The same excuse for killing over half a million Iraqi children. Such an offensive would be the latest page in volumes of history of U.S. terror inflicted against oppressed peoples who represent some type of threat to the status quo. In fact, the terrorist is the entire oppressed population, especially when we are engaged in generalized resistance. The Department of Homeland Security is in place to secure the political and economic interests of the white ruling class, which means carrying out a general campaign of repression against oppressed communities and the organizations who struggle in their interests. This is evident in the state of Pennsylvania Homeland Security's private contract with the Institute for Terrorism Research and Response, ITRR. As an article published earlier in the Burning Spear, Newspaper in Huru News states the Institute for Terrorism Research and Response, ITRR, is an Israeli based so called anti terror counterintelligence organization that received a $125,000 contract from the state of Pennsylvania, Homeland Security, to compile a list of organizations it considers to pose a threat to the status quo. And that list had been compiled by the ITRR, including the name Diab Olugbala, Wally Rahman, president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement in PEDEM. The so-called war on terror is a tactic used by the imperialist state to maintain its control of a system built on sucking the resources of virtually the entire world population. The war on terror is a tactic used by the imperialist state, sorry, the war on terror is a means of crushing the resistance of those who would dare to struggle for their freedom. This war keeps the big time gun manufacturers profits at an all time high, and we must expose the true nature of the war on terror and the special relationship that imperialism has with African and oppressed people. The strategic enemy of Africans and oppressed people is the U.S. imperialist state. 
And whether in Uganda, Palestine, Colombia, or Oakland, it is the imperialist state which stands between the people and our freedom. It is the imperialist state. If the imperialist state is to be destroyed, it will be as a consequence of the masses of oppressed and exploited Africans organizing to fight for their own self-interest. That is to say that the masses of Africans will be mobilized to join the call to join mobilized to the call to join the resistance based on their relationship to a program that calls for quality and community controlled housing, police, health care, education, etc. In the final analysis, it is a politically educated African community informed by revolutionary theory, which will become an irreversible force that will crush imperialism. And it is for this precise reason that the U.S. imperialist state goes through such measures to deny the African community access to guns and firearms. It creates special laws applicable to only us to ensure that we do not have access to guns. For in the hands of the oppressed, guns can be used to, to destroy the oppressor and its state apparatus. Therefore, the demand by Africans for the right to bear arms is met up with the response of a war against crime, gangs, drugs, terror, etc. Never it is allowed in the form of public debate the notion of Africans and oppressed people having the right to pick up arms against their oppressors. And to do so can quite possibly result in extreme political repression, imprisonment, and even murder. And that is what happened to the Black Panther Party and other forces in the Black Revolution in the 1960s. And for these reasons... Impedum approaches the question of guns and the African community's right to bear arms as a serious one with clear political and legal implications. We can start the discussion with the understanding that the U.S. law is colonial law. It is the opinion of the white ruling class, the slave master. It is used to maintain a system of oppression and exploitation of African people, period. There, therefore, there is no such thing as a U.S. law that the African should respect or abide by. However, in the absence of power, we as Africans and as a movement must recognize the constraints of colonial law. To not do so could bring serious consequences, but we must always struggle for more and more space within which we can carry out our revolutionary struggle. We must push the state back through democratic struggle. This in part means that we must expose the contradictory and colonial nature of the gun laws and prevent the state from justifying and enforcing those laws. More importantly, this will serve to help the masses come to correct conclusions around the dictatorial nature of the state, which enforces anti-black and colonial law only through force. Through the campaign for African community self-defense, Impedum has held Uhuru Law Schools as it relates to criminal and gun laws. Secondarily, this process serves to educate the people about what their legal rights are with regards to guns. However, primarily, this process serves to expose the state's disregard for law and thus mobilizes the people to politically challenge the colonial laws and the state itself. It is important that we understand that Impedum is not an army. An army is an organization whose primary task is to make armed struggle on behalf of and in the interests of a particular social force or sector within that social force. In revolution, armed struggle is but one phase that if carried out or initiated prematurely can result in deadly consequences for the revolutionary organization and the community it claims to represent. Further, if such struggle is carried out by forces who are not ideologically clear, you will have a dangerous situation for the revolutionary organization and the community, sorry, uh, ideologically, you have a dangerous situation for the masses and the revolution as well. On March 23rd to 24th, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement will hold its annual international convention. And the theme of the convention is One Africa, One Nation, protect and defend our own through organized resistance. The question of revolutionary resistance against the imperialist state will be dealt with during a panel called In the Struggle Against Colonialism, any act of African resistance is an act of self-defense. Comrades, these are very dangerous times, and although they are also times filled with great opportunities, we must be responsible, strategic, and highly disciplined in the way that we organize, and we must always maintain our ties to the masses, one Africa, one nation, protect and defend our own through organized resistance, forward to the Impedum Convention. Uhuru. And that Correct. article was six years ago. Yep. We have been engaged in imperialist destruction of the planet 
solidly for the last 120 years, United States, I believe. Mm -hmm. More than that, yeah, exactly. Uhuru. Uhuru. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, certainly can. Yeah, I mean, I know we, we want to talk about a few things about this article, but I just want to jump into the gun control issue for a second, if that's all right. That's, that's perfect. Okay. So I think this is a really important article to study, and I really appreciate the analysis that the party and the International People's Democratic Recruit Movement gave of the issue of gun control, because a lot of people are talking about gun control right now. Of course, you see these like teenagers that are um, making statements at press conferences that were like survivors of the, um, the shooting, calling for gun control and all this kind of stuff. And I want to address it, but I, okay, I want to just like separate people into two categories for a second. So let's say there's like a bunch of white people out there who are just like horrified by children being murdered in schools. So, and they think that gun control might somehow make that happen less often. Okay. I don't agree with that, but I want to address that separately from conscious political operatives from the Democratic Party and the liberal wing of U.S. imperialism who are using what happened in Parkland to try to advance the quote-unquote gun control issue. And first, I want to address them, okay, and then get back to people who are just looking for something to do to try to stop the murder of children. Okay, so in terms of the, these political operatives who are advancing the gun control thing, first of all, gun control is a lie. It's a misnomer because as Chairman Amali Shetela has already pointed out, there's already gun control in the African community. They ha this article talks about how they, the U.S. government, which is this, which is the biggest terrorist organization on the planet. Okay, they created um, this program to characterize oppressed people fighting for their liberation as terrorists. And more recently, we've seen that with the uh, documents that have been leaked from the FBI referring to black identified organizations fighting for black independence as black identity extremists, right? Under the guise of this campaign to criminalize black freedom fighters who are fighting for their identity and their independence, they have already arrested one African person, I believe in Texas, because they say he illegally owned a gun. He owned a gun. All right, I'm in St. Louis right now. After uh, Mike Brown was killed and the heroic rebellions in the streets of Ferguson took place, Guns were flying off the shelves throughout St. Louis, and it was white people who were buying those guns. Nobody is more armed mm -hmm. to the teeth in this country than white people. Mm -hmm. And the whole issue of gun control, what it really means is that the U.S. government wants to have a monopoly on violence. They want to have control of all the guns, and they especially want to prevent African people from having access to guns. Because, as Mao said, political power grows from the barrel of a gun especially mm -hmm. you know, when, when people are organized in pursuing their interests and their liberation. So it's a lie. Gun control is a lie. Um, that's all it means. It has nothing to do with trying to stop AR-15s from getting into the hands of white kids that are going to go shoot your children. It has absolutely nothing to do with that at all. So it's very cynical. It's very disgusting. And frankly, I would support gun control if it meant taking all the guns away from the white nationalists and the police, then maybe I would consider supporting gun control. If gun and the control, U.S. military. Yeah, and the mm -hmm. U.S. military, sure. But of course, that's not going to happen until oppressed people are victorious in their struggle for national liberation. That's what's going to implement real gun control. So that's one thing. And then for people who are uh, who are looking towards this as the solution, you know, really, I do think I address them by exposing the people who are pushing this agenda because your sentiments, which I assume are genuine of horror in response to the murder of children, are being played. They're being played by the most sinister force on the planet Earth, which is the U.S. government and the white ruling class. They're being played to basically continue a system that's built on violence. And it's it's not the solution. It's not the solution at all. And as for mental illness, which is the other thing that's being thrown around. They talk about gun control. It's kind of like the debate is, is it the guns or is it a mental health issue? And it's a completely false debate because as for the issue of mental illness, 
first of all, again, we've already established this whole society, this whole country, this whole government is predicated upon a platform of violence. Like every single moment of every single day in the white world is made possible by terror and violence going on someplace on the planet Earth or inside U.S. borders in the other America, which is the black community, the colonized African community, or the Mexican community, where you have lining the false illegitimate colonial borders of this country are mass graves filled with hundreds of Mexican corpses of Mexican people who have been shot down, murdered by border patrol. Okay, and that's in this country every single day that's going on. Or on the reservations, so-called reservations, the concentration camp that we refer to as reservations, where the average life expectancy of the native people of this land is 42 years old. That's the other side of the coin of our assumption and expectation of security and peace in the white community. So mental illness, I don't think that really quite explains it because it kind of reminds me of how, you know, white people in Europe, we were, we were murdering the whole planet Earth for hundreds of years. But then suddenly when uh, white people started killing other white people in Germany, now it's the Holocaust and it's genocide and it's the worst thing that's ever happened. It kind of reminds me of that because it's like, is it only mental illness because white people are killing white people? Was it mental illness when we lynched African people for over a hundred years? Were we mentally ill when we were running around uh, in, slaughtering the indigenous people? Was that mental illness run amok? Was mental illness the thing that chased us out of Europe and brought us to the Americas and to Africa and committing all of the savagery that we brought to the planet Earth? No, it wasn't mental illness. It was the material interests of parasitic capitalism, of building white wealth and opportunity through what the chairman talks about, the primitive accumulation, that initial assault on Africa, turning Africa into a warren for the hunting of African people, enslaving them, taking their labor, taking their resources, that's what that's the material basis for this culture of violence. And that's also the material basis for the culture of violence that manifests in, in white society. You know, it's not it's not mental illness. It's a natural outgrowth of a violent basis of the social system. How can you expect to build a society on top of permanent gore and terror that is not going to reflect that in all of its structures in every type of relationship, whether between child and parent? whether between husband and wife, whether between teacher and student, whether between anything, it's all of those relationships are gonna reflect the underlying base of the society, which is what? Domination, rape, violence, slavery. That's the underlying thing. Private property, that's the underlying thing. So that's gonna refract through every component, through every facet of the structure of the society. And that's what we're seeing with these school shootings. And the mental illness explanation just doesn't suffice. Mm -hmm. So there's I, a lot more we can say on that. A lot more, but go ahead. Yes. I I, I, re I, I really I really unite, and I want to appreciate that because, um, it, you know, the first thing that I think that I learned about a gun as a child was exactly that that trope of um, conservative gun toting. Um, yeah. You know, favor, I'm in favor of gun control. When I have my gun, I'm in control because I, I mean, there's just no better distillation of the terror that um, colonialism and imperialism has visited upon the planet um, mm -hmm. in that phrase. The first thing you learn about a gun is that people will do whatever you want to avoid dying. A gun mm -hmm. is meant to immediately kill somebody. And right. the way that guns have been used, especially in the United States, has, has been has been to force first the um, the indigenous people off of their land and, and murder them. You yeah. know, and many times with the, the government itself, um, you know, loudly proclaiming the bounties for 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 the I mean, like we hear about um scalpings happening during during uh our aggressive attacks on yeah. um on uh indigenous people here in the united states or at what we call the united states but it was actually um the uh american white white aggressors that were taking scalps so that they could collect their bounty from the u.s government 
Exactly. This was happening yeah. under our, our President Jackson. Je- uh, Abraham Lincoln was given a, an entire tract of land for free by the U.S. government because he participated in the, the aggression um, against uh, against uh, Chief Black Hawk in the Black Hawk War. It, you know, it's yes. it, it's it's there. It, it's more than just you know an abstraction when we talk about an inescapable dialectic. As Amali Yeshitela has taught us about the inescapable dialectic, it's more than an abstraction. It's the actual material conditions is that we have murdered and stolen everything and, 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 and raped, you know, just countless women and children as, as, part, of, as part of this imperialist conquest of the, of the earth and deterioration of the earth. Um, and, you know, for us to focus now on, Oh, you know, the, the white, the white community is in crisis because an AR-15 was brought in to, mm-hmm. to the schools there. I mean, it's, you know, it's so, it's so petty, um, not petty, but it's, it's, it pales in comparison to what we visited upon the world. So we, you know, the every town care, uh, statistic is 18 school shootings so far in 2018. And then, you know, people think that the debate is, well, what constitutes, constitutes a school she- shooting? How about the number of bombs we've dropped on Afghanistan and, and Syria mm-hmm. in, in 2018? You know, and, and what, what are those statistics? I mean, in the last right. year, I mean, we're talking about, you know, you, in, increase of, of violence. But, you know, the mass media is only characterizing an increase of, they're only contextualizing increase of violence in the affluent white community. And uh, by September of 2017, the U.S. had dropped 2,400 bombs on Afghanistan, which was uh, 1,100 more than it had the year before. In Syria, 30, almost 33,000. And then 100, in, in 100 strikes against so-called Al-Qaeda in Syria, you know, thousands of people, um, dying, you know, every year, a hundred people in the last month in Syria dead from U.S. airstrikes. Or we could talk about the number of Africans shot by the police. Um, and of the almost thousand people killed by the police last year, and that's just really, you know, what was reported as, as police homicide. Africans and colonies, people make up more than half while being less than a quarter of you know, of the population in the United States. And yep. then you see the Democratic Party and its operatives, um, you know, all over the state, all, in all sorts of institutions. Um, Aniko Kitamoma of uh, African People's Socialist Party in St. Petersburg went live with Gazi Kodzo, Secretary General of African People's Socialist Party, to discuss how Aniko at school, uh, he's 16, they were, they were, uh, they were uh, uh, the prin- principal who is, uh, has ties to the Democratic Party, had all of the children march out in the middle of the day for a 17-minute uh, mandatory vigil for the students of Parkland, but um, uh, the students at the school were not allowed to officially mourn or hold vig- vigils for their African classmates who had been lynched by the police. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah, I I think that's very revealing. And, you know, on both sides of the aisle with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, which are both organizations that advance the interests of the white ruling class. And as Chairman Amalish Tella has said, it, within America, within bourgeois capitalist society, bourgeois democracy, Elections are just a contest between competing sectors of the white ruling class. And in this country and in in the world under capitalist, imperialist white power, the purpose of the white ruling class at all times is to maintain the status quo of a system that is built on the enslavement and oppression of African people to enrich the white ruling class and the general white population. And all white people sit on this pedestal. So that's their agenda at all times. That's the agenda of the Democrats with the gun control thing. They don't care about your children. They do not care about your children at all, okay? Hillary Clinton does not care about your children. She will not lose any sleep 
if school shootings continue at the rate that they're going on right now. So the gun control thing is not about your children. It's about tightening the lockdown of colonized African people and other oppressed people fighting for their liberation. On the other side of the aisle, you have Donald Trump, who is a Republican and the current president, who's talking about the solution is arming police, giving police, or sorry, arming teachers, giving teachers guns and making basically militarizing school campuses. Once again, that is not to keep your white children safe. He does not care about your white children. The reason why he wants to do that is to further militarize African children, to further intensify the already very severe military presence of so-called school resource officers, mm -hmm. which are cops, um, on African campuses. That's the purpose of it, because that's what they're doing. So they're all trying to use this ongoing, you know, reality that's not going to change until the whole social system is overturned, which it will be, um, of, of violence within white society. They're just using it as an excuse to further the counterinsurgency, to further the colonial oppression of African people. The only party that actually cares about your children is the African People's Socialist Party, because the mm -hmm. African People's Socialist Chart Party is struggling to overturn this social system that requires violence for its existence and build a new social system where nobody lives at the expense of anybody else and where no child has to worry about dying, about being murdered. No child has to worry about that because right now the murder of children is the norm, just not white children. It's the murder of African and Arab and Asian and Mexican and indigenous children, which is the norm. And we can't just try to make things safe for white children and not face the reality that in order for that to happen under this social system, it requires this mass murder and this death imposed upon African and other colonized children all over the world. So that's why reparations is the only answer. Reparations is the only response from white people to this, even this mass shooting. It's the only thing that makes sense. Reparations, like the chairman said, white people must become anti-colonialists as a matter of self-defense. So if you're worried about your white children dying in their school at the hands mm -hmm. of some school shooter, join this organization and organize for reparations to African people, which is like a bullseye, if you will, right at the heart of this social system itself, of imperialism, of white power, of the culture of violence. That's how you can defend your children. Fight for reparations to African people. Join this organization under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Um, this study, like every study, um, we raise reparations um, to African people in the white community. That's what the Solidarity Movement um, unites to do. And that is our solidarity with black power and with African liberation movement is material solidarity. It's if you unite that, um, that you want your children to be safe, if you want to have a better world, you know, it, we have to reckon with and take responsibility for our complicity with this system that we benefit. You know, as, as white people, we live on this pedestal on the backs of African and colonized people. And if you want to overturn that system, you have to, you have to unite with reparations. You have to pay reparations and we have to repair this relationship. Um, yeah, not only, not only to rejoin humanity, but as a matter of self-defense, exactly, mm -hmm. as a matter of self-defense. Because as we can see, no one's children are safe. And, exactly. you know, and, and, and this is, you know, this is like, you know, the, su the super excellent analysis that, you know, I, I have been able to, to, um, to listen to through all these presentations and working with the Hru Solidarity Movement. Um, the idea that somehow we're in fascist times or that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, what white people are experiencing, experiencing now is worse than it's ever been. And it's like African people have been catching hell yep. for centuries, for centuries. Exactly. It's just now um, I think I think that, that the white people have been exposed to their own vulnerability in white power system. I mean, like white power does nothing for you. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, tell me what white power has done for you lately. And I will, I will tell you that, you know, white power is responsible 
for that AR-15 shooting up children yes, at schools. Exactly. That is what that's what white power has done for you lately. White power is responsible for the fact that you have no health care. White power is responsible for the fact that you know you're you're struggling to pay your bills and and uh, you know even even as you benefit from your position on the pedestal of oppression of all people, you still have nothing. You know, and 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 that's and that's you know it's because parasitic capitalism has to suck everything, has to suck everything dry. It requires a blood meal, and you know as African colonized people resist. It, it it will it, you know we the entire circumstances that we, that we have built this legacy of terror are going to deteriorate and it's just you know we have a um we have to we have to recognize the urgency of 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 uniting with the strategy for african liberation and reparations is the strategy and so the goal for this study in reparations to african people is $100 tonight and one hundred dollars is also the monthly uh, sustainer level mm-hmm. for um, our Ella Baker level sustainer membership. It's one hundred dollars every month. It returns twelve hundred dollars in reparations to African people every year, and that goes towards the um, economic development programs of, of which there are over two dozen of the African People's Socialist Party, including the Black Power Blueprint. Get my button out there. Got my button in the mail. Um, that's going on in St. Louis right now, which Jesse um, was uh, is building. The, it's building the new St. Uh, sorry, the new uh, St. Louis Uhuru House, which Jesse was a part of the volunteer work today um, in St. Louis. And so I want to go to the comments right now, and I want to see who has one hundred dollars of stolen white resources that they can return to these programs because you know there's there's a strategy of the African People's Socialist Party to to build for economic and political power in St. Louis right now and that's what we're calling the Black Power Blueprint or this was being called the Black Power Blueprint under the leadership of the deputy chair owners and a Yeshitella it's a genius mm-hmm. strategy for maintaining the resources of the African community in the African community, it's a stance against gentrification. You know, it's building a community center, building a uh, community commercial kitchen with a, uh, with a, um, a felon workforce training program so that, you know, so that the African community has self-determination over where resources are going, uh, housing, and, um, and has a community meeting space that's 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 controlled and and um and uh, and open and available and you, you think about the contradiction of black lives matter in St. Louis and how there's no building that you can go into there's no there's no offices there's no meeting space nothing uh, material has been done with the billions of George Soros's philanthropic money <laughs> nothing yep. has been done and it's because organizations like Black Lives Matter um, are are very much aligned with the state's interests. They're diversions from what would be a- actual African liberation, and that's what you know. The, the, you know, African People's uh, Socialist Party is is they're materialists. It's about getting actual boots on the ground and work completed. So I'm going to the comments right now, and I am seeing five dollars from Evan Garner, Uhuru. Uhuru Evan. Uhuru Evan, excellent. And Jackson Hollingsworth says, "So many of us spend over a hundred dollars on coffee and pastries a month. So much on all sorts of frivolous things. We can definitely raise, raise, reach this hundred dollar goal tonight." Absolutely. So I, you know, I want to um, plug for a second that we're going to be in the St. Louis Uhura House that is yes. under, under construction right now for the 2018 um, Uhura Solidarity Movement National Convention. And that is just so exciting. Yes. And so how is it looking today? The Uhura House? Yeah. 
looking beautiful. Looks absolutely beautiful. The vision of Deputy Chair Onizanea Shatella and the Chairman Omale Shatella is coming to fruition. It looks absolutely magnificent. It's just like less than a week from completion. And yes, as you mentioned, we'll have our national convention right there in Aquaba Hall. So it's going to be amazing. Uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Register for the USM National Convention. It's going to be April 14th and 15th. And I'm going to put the Eventbrite link up there real quick. But um, does anyone have $50 for the study tonight um, to return in reparations to African people? $50 is, um, I think, our Fannie Lou Hamer level, or is that $40? I believe that's 40. We should double 40. check that. Double check that. For me. Yeah, forty dollars. But um, Ella Baker, the Ella Baker sustainership is just such an incredible commitment to this type of work because there's absolutely nothing else that's being done right now by any organization of, of this level of what the party is trying to accomplish. And you know, and Ella Baker, one of the most profound um, statements from Ella Baker. Um, about exactly this type of, of circumstance that we're talking about today with the killing of children until the killing of black men, black mother's sons becomes important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. I mean, the, the, that's, you know, exactly what we're talking about. That there's just two Americas. There's two worlds. There is the world... Of, of the the white oppressor nation, and we're completely ignorant that underneath our foot, you know, it, at, under on this pedestal, you know, that we assume like there's an American dream or our suburban houses, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're completely ignorant of the fact that, of the terror that we visit around the world in order to have what we have. And I want to um, I want to pledge. Uh, Fifty dollars to the study tonight myself. Right on. Um, because you know, it, I just, I, I, I really, I, the anxiety and the frustration that I see on all of the faces of you know um, the y my friends who are young moms, mm -hmm. and I would, and I wish they could, they could, you know, you know, you talk about guns, but you remove guns, you, you, anyone can access illegal guns. You know, that's, you know, gun control is, is, is not is not anything except for a foil for the state to yep. continue to visit, you know, terror upon African colonized people. And you you want to talk about mental illness. But, you know, the, the only people that whose mental illness that the state cares about <laughs> are, are, are white people's mental illness. You know, and we see that the police are killing African African women who are struggling with mental illness all the time and that you know you could be suicidal and you could call for help and a, and a police officer is, is likely to shoot you dead yeah and, I mean yeah sorry well you know, continue continue please, please well I think also on the issue of mental illness that you know like one of the sayings in the Uhuru movement in terms of in the case of what they're talking about in the African National Women's Organization, they say there's no such thing as women in general. There's the women of the oppressed nation and the women of the oppressor nation that experience different realities. And I would just add, there's no such thing as mental illness in general. And the mental illness experienced in the African community is symptomatic of living under colonial oppression. It's a natural response to having your entire identity stolen from you having all your resources stolen from you and being forced to live in a state of colonial servitude under a foreign alien hostile white nationalist state power and in the white nation. So that is one form of mental illness that manifests itself. It's colonialism that you're seeing. It's, an ex it's the experience of being colonized. And then you have the mental illness of white people, which I think is the mental illness of the colonizer. And if we even want to assume that mental illness has anything to do with it, okay, well then where does what mental illness come from for white people? If you live in a society where your ability to wake up in the morning and face the day is nourished by the bloodshed of billions of people on the planet Earth, how can you expect to be mentally healthy? 
how can you expect to be mentally healthy living as a part of a social system that's built on rape? How are you going to be mentally healthy living in a rape society, living in a slavery society? How, how are you supposed to be mentally healthy? What does it even look like? I don't, I don't even understand what a mentally well-adjusted white people, what, what white person, what is going through your head? I have absolutely no idea because I understand mental illness of a white person that when you look at the fact that the entire white population is living in this, in this hideous state of isolation from the rest of humanity at the expense of billions of human beings on the planet earth, that makes a lot more sense to me. So um, the cure to mental illness is not all these medications that they want to pump into white people and into, into African people as well. Uh, you know, all these, all these psychiatric drugs that they want to push onto people. That's not the solution to mental illness. The solution to mental illness is the same thing we've been talking about is in attacking the roots of a social system that creates mental illness because it's based on the worst violence you can imagine. You know, it's a culture of denial. It's a culture of denial and opportunism and what Chairman Amalia Chatella called the ignorance of convenience. That's what we're looking at. So that's going to make you mentally ill. It's going to make you mentally ill. And the only way out of that is taking responsibility to overturn this social system through reparations to African people, through unconditional material solidarity with African people and their struggle for freedom. That's the only way. I mean, and it, it, there's no, I mean, there's no other role for us. There's no other role for white people. I mean, we have the access to the resources and we have to uh, return them because without this economic basis, white power can't survive. And yeah. it's white power that, that, that's killing us. It's, you know, it's white power imperialism that has to be overturned and it has to be overturned. Not, it's not, going to just happen through the hearts and minds of people it's going to happen through access to resources and power right you know, we have to be materialist about this as you know is the understanding that we come to under the leadership of the african people's socialist party and it's you know it's incredible it's incredible to see how how beautiful the world that is being imagined um, after after the fall of colonialism, after the fall of imperialism, and it looks like the Black Power Blueprint. And it, it is, you know, it is that is the future that is anxiety free. That is what you want to unite with. And I want to say, Uhuru to Jackson. Jackson is pledging five dollars. So we have we are at uh, sixty dollars right now. Uhuru. Uh-huh. Uhuru. All right. Uh, Amanda, I will return $20. The work of the African People's Socialist Party is building a world where no child will be a victim of the horrendous violence of white society. Reparations yes. now. Uhuru. Uhuru. All right. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Amanda. Deeply appreciate you, comrade. So we are at um, now $80. We have $20 to go for uh to reach our hundred dollar goal tonight and twenty dollars um twenty dollars in the in the hands of these economic programs is incredible and just like the immense amount of unity around and the success story of the black power blueprint and the uhuru house um this phase one that's happening in st louis right now um i'm just so excited for it because i mean this is going to happen everywhere. I mean, as the chairman says, like African people are going to are are going to be free, whether or not you know we unite with it or not, whether or not white people unite with it or not. Like resistance is everywhere, all over the world, and uh, yeah, and we're going to be a part of this. Um, Baytosh, one hundred percent. Evan Garner says, truth, chair, Jesse, mental illness in the Africans and indigenous people is sanity and system built to break you down to a shell or a ghost. White people who aren't seriously concerned, concern me. Yeah, I mean, just one other thing about the mental illness thing, because one time at an event in St. Pete, we were talking about that. And this white woman got very upset 
and she was saying that we were being ableist, which I'm, I don't quite understand that because um, we're not uh, diminishing the reality of mental illness as something that afflicts and disfigures the lives of many, many people. We're trying to identify its source and point towards how it can be overturned through using the understandings of the party and African internationalism. Um, but one of the things that she said is, oh, so you're saying that once colonialism is overturned, then mental illness is not going to exist anymore. And, you know, actually, I didn't say that, but that's a good way of putting it. I don't disagree with that because you can't take anything out of the context of the social system that we live in. You can't take it out of the context. It's not like there's imperialism and colonialism and, and it's, the, it's the whole worldwide system. But then mm. there's like a mentally ill white person over there in the corner. And somehow there's no relationship between the two. Everything we experience, or even every thought we experience is shaped and molded by the fact that we inhabit part of this social structure that's built upon oppression and slavery. So you can't take anything out of that context. And like you said, Valerie, the, world, the vision of the world that the African People's Socialist Party, that the Uhuru movement has, it's a beautiful, optimistic vision. Yes, it's going to at least massively uh, reduce the prevalence of mental illness. Ma absolutely, because people will be able to see a future. And an inability to see a future is becoming increasingly common, even amongst white people in this society. Because up absolutely. until now, up until now, our assumption of a future of being able to get go to college, get a good job and ma get married and have some kids, and get a nice house and have two cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That assumption of a future has been built upon. It has been sustained by what we've been talking about, colonial oppression, murder, violence against all the peoples on the planet Earth. And mm -hmm. they're fighting back. They're taking back their resources. They're coming for their resources no matter what. And if that means coming for white people's heads, then so be it, because they're coming for their resources. They want their freedom. Nothing's going to stop them from achieving their liberation. And that is cutting off the lifeline of this parasitic reality that we've taken for granted. So now that assumption of a future is no longer there. And mm -hmm. white people are dying in droves. White people are killing ourselves. We're taking drugs. We're drinking alcohol. We're committing suicide. Or in some cases, we're going and getting a gun and going and killing people in a school or in some other movie theater or something like that. That's the crisis of imperialism. That's the crisis of white power because that thing which has sustained it up to now, which is the oppression of African people and other oppressed people is coming to an end because the oppressed peoples of the world are winning. So we don't see a future in this social system anymore. And there's even been articles in bourgeois newspapers like the New York mm -hmm. Times saying white people are dying in droves from deaths of despair. Well, as Chairman Penny has said, what the Uhuru movement and the Uhuru Solidarity movement represents is the opportunity to turn our despair into revolution, into revolutionary fervor, to change the world so that no child has to suffer and die. And no child has to live in a world at the expense of other children suffering and dying. And that's a beautiful, optimistic vision that includes all of humanity being able to flourish. And that's what we have the opportunity to be a part of. That is our redemption. That is our hope. That is our future is in solidarity with African liberation. So yes, it will drastically reduce the prevalence of mental illness. Mm -hmm. we'll very healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, and, and, and we're not just simply making these statements, you know, as bourgeois opportunist uh, magazines and, uh, you know, programming on television mm -hmm. or vice media, you know, oh, let's, let's talk about, you know, the crisis of imperialism, but, but not have any strategy or solution. No, we're a re yeah. revolutionary organization. And, uh, and under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, we are about strategy and we are that strategy. That strategy is reparations. So I want to um, salute Betash. Yes, um, uh, pledging 12, oh, sorry, pledging $20 tonight to get us to our $100 goal. Uhuru, that's fantastic. And yes, um, yeah, this is this is this is not just 
you know, discussing academically or discussing abstractly, you know, the crisis, the crisis of imperialism and parasitic capitalism or talking, you know, academically or in a historical sense about the legacy of colonialism and violence. Um, mm. This is an academic debate. This is right. about uh, a solution and solidarity, something real, that, something material that can that you can be a part of right now. Because um, the only way this will be overturned is by the returning the economic basis for the suppression. Ret you know, the economic basis for the suppression is the fact that white people have hoarded all of the resources of Africa and North America and South America in their banks, you know, in their companies, in their in their in their private family wealth for hundreds of years. And, you know, and so the the solution and the strategy is obvious it has to be it's it's reparations we have to repair this relationship we have to reckon and you know and i just want to salute all the comrades super deep unity um in the uh, that we're a part of this the study tonight um returning reparations you can pay reparations at uhurusolidarity.org and click on the red button on the right hand side that says pay reparations and you know just so thrilled to do this study with you. It's so great to get um, get uh, all of our comrades up on the Solidarity uh, Spear study so that uh, we can share our appreciation uh, for African internationalism. Uhuru, uhuru comrade Jesse. Uhuru, it's great anything to be a part of this. Yeah, anything else you wanna, you wanna say before we close out? Cause we've gone 11 minutes over, but it was an absolute delight. Oh dear. Well, um, I, yeah, I just want to respond to Mr. Grusewitz, and I, I know we're, we're over time, so I won't be long here, but uh, I see a comment, let's not pretend donations to a political party is reparations. Well, mm -hmm. donations to a political party of the African working class struggling to reclaim all of the resources of African people to rebuild Africa and the African nation under the leadership of the African working class is reparations. So you just mm -hmm. forgot to put those words in your statement there. Um, it's not just to a political party, it's to a political party of the African working class struggling for the national liberation of African people. How is that not reparations? How is it not reparations for white people to turn over the stolen wealth of African people to a movement that is fighting to reclaim all of Africa's wealth for African people? That's the highest expression of reparations as defined by the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. No, it is not. Excellent rebuttal. Excellent rebuttal. So I just want to salute all of the comrades for watching um, this, this live stream and to everybody who contributed towards the reparations goal. And I also want to salute Valerie, our amazing InfoEd chair, uh, for leading these studies. And salute to comrade Connor, who usually is on these and always does an amazing job. And yeah. it's an honor, an honor to participate. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you so much. They, oh, Kyle, this has been so brilliant and insightful. Exactly. Uh -huh, Kyle. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everyone um, who joined us this evening. I know we're a little bit over, but it was a total pleasure. And uh, reparations now. And you, uh -huh. reparations. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, thank you.